Hello and welcome to the channel. I hope you all had a great Christmas and New Year celebrations with friends and family where possible. Let's hope 2021 is a better year than 2020. I also want to take the time to thank you all for the continued support the channel has received in the months since starting my true crime series. I've genuinely been overwhelmed by the kind words from everyone and wasn't expecting the reception my videos would receive to be as positive as they have been currently. I can only hope to keep making content that you continue to come back for. If you're here for the first time and you want to see more of the cases I've covered, please like, share and subscribe to the channel, as well as hitting the notification bell so you don't miss out on any future videos I release. I also have a playlist you can watch if you want to catch up with my previous videos. Once again, thank you. In today's video, we'll be travelling to Clydebank, Scotland, where on the 19th of March 2016, 15 year old Paige Doherty would go missing while travelling to work at a salon where she was a part time employee. Paige was born on the 18th of April 2000 to parents Pamela Munro and John Bothwell. Paige would live with her mother, as well as her stepfather, Andrew Munro, and her two siblings. She was a regular teenager who was popular among her friends and well loved by her family. She had aspirations of becoming a hairdresser and managed to pick up a part time job working at a salon. On the 18th of March 2016, Paige stayed with her friend Lauren Mills for the night, where the pair would practice their hairdressing and beauty skills, as well as do other things typical teenage girls get up to. It was said that when she had arrived, she was described as being in a 100% carefree mood. The following morning, Paige had left Lauren's home and made her way to her work, Street Image Hairdressers in Kirk and Tillock. The plan was that Paige would catch a bus to Buchanan Street bus station, where she would then catch another bus, which would take her to her place of work. While on her way to catch her bus, she stopped by a delicious deli in Clydebank to get herself some breakfast before continuing her journey. However, Paige would not make it to work that morning. Alarm bells began to ring when friends noticed that Paige hadn't updated her social media accounts, which was something they thought was very unusual. Initially, Lauren, who was concerned that she hadn't heard from Paige, reached out to her friend's mother, Pamela, to see if she had heard from her. While Pamela had not heard from Paige, she tried to reassure Lauren that it was likely Paige was still working, as her shift wasn't expected to end until later that evening, and that she would likely hear from Paige afterwards. Pamela would also say it was possible Paige had forgotten her phone charger, as this was something Paige would often do. 6pm would come and go without Paige showing up, although the family was still not overly concerned, still believing that the reason for Paige's absence would be down to more innocent reasons, such as at a friend's home or at a party. Despite the family's belief that there was a rational explanation, Paige's friends would continue to grow worried and reached out to social media in the hope of tracking down Paige. Friends would also send Paige messages asking where she was and to hurry home. While the messages were delivered, they were marked as unread. None of her friends had any success in reaching out to Paige. This was completely unlike her. It wasn't long before Pamela discovered Paige hadn't turned up for work that morning. The family's concerns had now increased dramatically. The salon began questioning Paige's whereabouts at around midday. They had attempted to reach out to her in multiple ways, such as Facebook, WhatsApp, calling and text messaging. But like Paige's friends, they received no response. As soon as Pamela was made aware of Paige's absence from work, she immediately contacted the police to report her daughter missing. At this point, Paige had already been missing for 13 hours. The following day, and with Paige now missing for 24 hours, the residents of Clydebank were awoken to radio appeals for Paige's whereabouts and for her safe return. Andrew and Pamela would also participate in some radio interviews. Many people would search for Paige, driving around the area in the hopes of bumping into her, going to locations where Paige would be known to go to, as well as placing missing person posters out on the streets, questioning bus drivers and raising awareness on social media. However, as time went on, fears that something bad had happened to Paige had grown. 
Pamela had even asked police when they would start searching ditches, although they would assure her that there was no need to think the worst at this stage of the search. They would tell Pamela that nine times out of ten they would find the missing teenagers safe and well, but Pamela felt that she was facing the scenario where her daughter was the one that wouldn't be. The search of the neighbourhood drew no results, leading the police to increase their efforts. By now, their concerns were beginning to grow. They had searched the family home to rule out any foul play, and had also began house-to-house searches and retracing Paige's last known steps. Thirty hours into Paige's disappearance, police were now attending local businesses in the hope of finding any information which could point them into finding Paige. News agent owner, Ashi Ahmed, confirmed to the police that he had witnessed Paige entering the delicious deli at around 8.20am on the morning of Paige's disappearance, after briefly speaking with her. When police visited the deli, John Leatham, the owner of the business, confirmed to police that Paige was a regular customer of the deli and had visited the store to order breakfast. John Leatham then told police that Paige had left to continue her journey to work. With police now knowing where Paige was on the morning of her disappearance, they turned their attention to the bus routes that Paige would have taken in order to get to the salon. Police obtained CCTV and spoke to bus drivers, who would have driven the routes Paige needed to take for more information. By Monday the 21st of March, a major incident room was set up and Paige was now being considered a high-risk missing person. By now, the reality that Paige wouldn't be found alive was becoming a frightening possibility. Investigators would search the family home again, now focusing on concentrating their search to those close to Paige. They also took statements from Pamela and Andrew. Although 52 hours into Paige's disappearance, and while in the middle of searching the family home, a body was found. The body of the young woman was found in a bush along a road nearby in the local area. The killer had made some effort to conceal the body by covering her with grass. Despite the strong possibility that the body of Paige had been found, police were still keen to keep the missing person's inquiry open in the hopes the body found was unrelated to the ongoing case. Forensics were called to the scene where they began to search for clues. They found the girl to be very young, with multiple stab wounds to the head and neck. There were 61 stab wounds, 43 of these were to the head and neck, as well as a further 85 slash wounds. Furthermore, her nose had been broken and her eye was slit straight across. There was also a hole in the body the size of a man's fist, created by an uncountable amount of stabbings inflicted on the young girl's body. There was also a substantial amount of blood found on the victim, but not in the surrounding area. This strongly indicated that the murder took place elsewhere and that the body had been dumped where it had been found. Paige's family were informed and were asked to identify the body. Pamela and Andrew attended the morgue and tragically, it was confirmed that the victim was Paige Doherty. News of Paige's death sent shockwaves through the Clydebank community as it was now clear a killer was walking among this otherwise close-knit community. The police were now hunting for whoever carried out this despicable act. While the community rallied together to pay their respects, the police had a task on their hands. There was no motive, no rhyme or reason for the killing. Police also had no suspects and no clear leads. Police trawled through the evidence they had gathered so far and went back to the location where Paige was last seen. They re-examined the statement provided by John Leatham to work out where Paige could have gone after leaving the deli. Police discovered one of the nearby shops near the deli had CCTV positioned outside of the store. They were able to find Paige on the CCTV, entering its view and heading towards the shop. There was just one problem. There was an issue with John Leatham's statement. Paige entered the deli, but she didn't leave. John Leatham had lied to the police. When police reviewed the CCTV footage from the neighbouring shop, as well as the CCTV from the deli itself, they had discovered the following. At approximately 7.17am, the shutters can be seen opening to the deli, showing that John Leatham has arrived to begin opening up for the day. Just over an hour later, at around 8.21am, 
Paige is captured on CCTV on the neighbouring shop, walking towards the deli where she enters. Soon after, John is spotted on the external cameras running from the deli, closing the shutters where he runs away towards his home. He shortly returns with his car. At around 9.58am, John is then spotted leaving the deli, where he enters a newsagent's next door. He is seen again approximately one minute later, leaving the shop, running back to the deli. Roughly five minutes later, external CCTV spots John leaving the deli, where he opens the boot of his car, retrieves some items before returning to the shop, leaving the boot open. Moments later, he returns outside, this time with a full bin bag which he stuffs into the back of the car. Around midday, the external cameras again pick up Lethem, leaving the deli where he enters his car and drives away. He isn't spotted again until after 6pm that same day, where he enters his deli, leaving the shutters half closed, where he goes out to the kitchen area. Police immediately knew that John was now their prime suspect and informed Paige's family that an arrest was impending. John Lethem was placed under arrest and taken into police custody. The discovery that John was responsible for Paige's death was shocking to the community to say the least. John was a 31-year-old married father who opened the deli in 2013. Those who knew him were in disbelief that this seemingly normal, well-respected man could be capable of such an act of evil. Regardless, the question which was on everybody's minds was now apparent. Why? Despite the overwhelming evidence pointing the finger firmly in the face of Lethem, he maintained that he was not involved with Paige's death. Forensics were called to the delicious deli to find evidence which would link John to Paige's murder they would also obtain warrants to search his home and car. However, when police searched the deli, they were unable to find any obvious signs of blood or anything to suggest that a struggle had taken place on the property. Even the police within the deli provided no evidence to connect John to the crime. This revelation had police perplexed. The CCTV clearly showed Paige enter, but not leave the deli. Furthermore, the actions of John Lethem on the day were indeed suspicious to say the least. Something was missing and police needed to find out fast, otherwise they'd have to let Lethem go. Suddenly, a witness came forward to police and provided information which solidified the police's view that the murder had taken place at the deli. The witness, Ashi Ahmed, who had earlier stated to police that he had seen Paige on the morning of her disappearance, told police that he saw the shop shutters close approximately five minutes after he entered. He then saw Lethem at approximately 9.30am, where he heard a neighbouring business employee ask John what was on his nose, to which he replied that he had a nosebleed. He then visited Ashi's newsagent shortly after 10am to purchase bin bags, antibacterial wipes and bleach. Knowing this, the police researched the deli with the intention of searching for any small evidence, like hair or fibres. Forensics would lift the floorboards to find blood which had seeped underneath, as well as blood found on the oven and between the fridge and freezer. It was apparent now that Lethem had thoroughly cleaned the area to hide what he had done. Police now had what they needed to charge Lethem. Although they would first present the evidence in the hopes he would confess, as well as provide a motive to explain this sickening crime. In September 2016, six months after the murder, 
John Leatham appeared in court. Here, he would finally confess to the murder of Paige Doherty, as well as provide his apparent motive as to why he carried out his frenzied attack. Leatham had stated that on the day of the murder, Paige came in and ordered breakfast. While she waited, the pair had got to chatting, and according to John, Paige had expressed an interest in working at the deli. John said he then let Paige into the back to complete an application form, although upon realising that Paige was only 15, he apparently told her that she was too young to work there. Leatham said that Paige threatened that if he didn't give her a job at the deli, she would report him for sexual assault. John said that he panicked, as he was convinced people would believe Paige, given that his brother was already a convicted sex offender. It was then that he carried out the attack on Paige. However, this explanation was not accepted by the courts, as there was no evidence to support the claims John was making. There was no application form found at the deli. Paige already had a job, which she was happy in, and those who knew Paige stated that this was not something she would ever do to someone. The courts also learned that after removing Paige's body from the deli, he left her in his car while he continued to serve customers for the remainder of the day. Afterwards, John took Paige's body to his home, where he locked her body inside his garden shed and took his wife and child out. He would then move her body to where she was found, two days after the murder took place. On the 12th of October 2016, John Leatham was sentenced to life imprisonment, with the possibility of parole after serving 27 years. John Leatham, you have pleaded guilty to the murder of a 15-year-old defenceless child and a second charge of attempting to defeat the ends of justice by trying to cover up your actions. The circumstances of the crime, all as described in, in the agreed narrative, disclose that this was a savage, frenzied attack. In my view, no evidence of any motive has been put before me to explain the ferocity of this attack. You must have struck the victim in excess of 146 times with a knife, which on your account just happened to be handy in the back room of your shop. These were not just stab wounds, but they included many slashing type injuries. And this number of injuries excludes the separate repeated blows, which must have been delivered to inflict the large gaping wound on her neck which ultimately left, led to her bleeding to death. What you did was truly reprehensible. It is impossible to comprehend how an apparently happily married man with a young child who's running a successful business is capable of such a horrific level of violence. Your mental state has been investigated and there is no suggestion, as far as I can determine, of any psychiatric or psychological explanation for what you did. In respect of the murder charge, there is only one sentence which I can impose, and that is life imprisonment. On charge one, you will be sentenced to life imprisonment, and in view of the brutality and nature of this attack, together with the aggravating factors, all is disclosed in the narrative, including the circumstances of charge two, the punishment part I would have imposed but for the discount is 30 years. I'm prepared to discount that by three years, having regard to the point at which you pleaded guilty. The resultant punishment part is 27 years. Those periods will run concurrently and will date from the 26th of March this year when you were first remanded in custody. That's all. He would appeal the sentencing, arguing that the punishment handed out was too severe. Somehow, the courts agreed, and in February 2017, his sentence was reduced to life imprisonment, with the possibility of parole in 23 years. Paige's death naturally shattered the family, although there have been some moments of brightness since. Pamela and Andrew have since had another child, and have vowed to ensure that the memory of Paige lives on, and that her younger sibling, she never got to meet, knows about her big sister. Paige was also known for pouting in photos that she took, 
so the family set up the Pout for Page Facebook page, designed for people to take pictures of themselves pouting, where these can then be shared as a way of celebrating the life of Page Doherty. As for John Leatham, he was moved from Lomos Prison to HMP Dumfries in 2017, after it was revealed that inmates had plotted to kill him. He'll be eligible for parole in 2039. This has to be one of the most senseless acts of violence I've come across since beginning in my true crime series. There just appears to be no rhyme or reason as to why John Leatham did what he did. His claim that he killed Paige out of fear of being falsely accused of sexual assault was ludicrous. It's worth noting that the CCTV was tampered with, which was why the police didn't have video proof of the murder. Furthermore, if John really was worried about Paige falsely accusing him, the CCTV would be the very thing that would clear him of any wrongdoing. It just doesn't make sense. The popular theory is that John made advancements towards Paige, who rejected him. Tragically, this was what made him snap. Sadly though, we'll never know the truth, as John has never said what actually happened that morning. Nevertheless, it is relieving to know that the investigation was a quick one, and that justice was served for Paige. Thank you for watching. If you like true crime and want to see more videos by me, you can check the playlist I've created for you to do just that. Please remember to like and share this video, as well as subscribe so you can keep up to date with new true crime videos I release. Until next time, take care and goodbye. For now.